don't know about you, but I am told that I'm not alone in the feeling a bit of dread when it comes to networking events and conferences. My inner introvert wants to curl up in a ball in the corner as I think about the feeling of walking into a room with strangers to make small talk. I can almost feel myself standing while I drink cold coffee out of a tiny hotel cup with a smile plastered across my face as I can't bother the minutes until I can politely excuse myself. And now we have online networking events added to the mix, which adds an additional layer of challenges with glitchy technology, poor sound quality, and unclear social norms. Now it's sitting in your living room, hoping your family doesn't make a scene behind you while you try to introduce yourself in a breakout room. Look, going to an event or attending an online one and leaving feeling terrible is a waste of your time and energy. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't mean that you should forego these kinds of events altogether. In fact, our guest can probably help given his experiences. Hello and welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast brought to you by SproutWorld.com. I'm an A-Coach and our guest today is Ben Albert. Ben, you've had a number of sales and marketing roles prior to COVID, but then COVID hit and your story and journey took a bit of a turn. Tell us, how did things change and how did we get to where you are now, which is Real Business Connections, a podcast network? Oh my, how long do we have? (laughs) Vinay, I'm blessed to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. As you were describing these networking struggles and anxiety, I started to get a little anxious because that the thought of being in a busy hotel with a cold coffee and a bunch of people I don't know that are just looking to label me based on my industry and have some quick small talk makes me it's cringy it's cringy and my the second part a big part of my story really did begin in covid when i was furloughed from my sales executive role and in slightly over a year replaced my sales executive income as an entrepreneur i don't say that to brag or be braggadocious it's really just Mm -hmm. to impress upon the point that it's possible we can talk about how i did it and during covid There wasn't these big, fancy networking events with a bunch of small talk and the cold coffee. It was all virtual. And I'm very introverted. And I struggle in conversation if I can't go deep with someone. There's too much external stimuli distracting people. If I can't ask why questions, sit back and let someone talk like you're doing right now for minutes at a time and share and spend the time together, I'm actually not in my zone of genius. So the super busy in-person networking events never was my zone of genius anyways. It doesn't mean I couldn't get better at it, but the virtual world and social media and podcasting during COVID by chance was more of my zone of genius and I was able to build my marketing firm. So bless that led me back to being here with you today and here to serve in any way we can. Sure. What exactly did you do during, after COVID hit, being furloughed to start what is now your podcast network? Yeah, I could give you all the nosebleeds, but I think your audience wants something super actionable. But to graze over the nosebleeds, I didn't have a playbook and didn't know exactly what I was doing. I learned this by taking action and trying different things. But I'm from Rochester, New York. I had just started a business. Called it Balbert Marketing because I'm Ben Albert and I couldn't think of a better name and I had to write something on the line to get an LC. And I had been building a corporate brand my entire career. Now I had to build a personal brand, which I want to connect because a lot of the listeners might be in a enterprise or corporate environment. You can still do exactly what I did and build a personal brand no matter where you are in life. And if I were to go back, I would have started this forever ago. I started a bo- business podcast called Rochester Business Connections because I was from Rochester, New York, and I wanted more business connections. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really much more complicated than that. And what I learned over time is those connections were two kinds of people. One, people that I wanted to learn from, and they were able to take tens of years of wisdom, hundreds of millions of revenue, and squeeze it into an hour-long conversation for me 
so I can get the best tactics and tips from them and go implement it and do it quicker. And the Mm. other kind of people were potential clients, business owners in my hometown that I knew that I could serve with my services that I didn't come in and pitch them on the podcast, but I had an opportunity to build a relationship with this person. And a lot of my podcast guests in Rochester, New York, they didn't become clients, but did they become friends, peers, referral partners that generated income through goodwill and thought leadership and relationships? Absolutely. So little old me basically started a little old podcast. This was well before I scaled it to real business connections and decided to market nationally. I took my target niche, Rochester, New York business owners, created a podcast, which doesn't have to be a podcast. It could be a blog, a live event. There's lots of things we can do, but I created a medium around these people. And that's how I started networking during the pandemic and built my business. Brilliant. I love the simplicity of that sitting on level thinking. I'm also curious, what would you say that would be your personal area of strength? Yeah, I think you just nailed it on accident. You said, I love the simplicity of that level of thinking. I'm a very logical, rational guy. I see things in a very simple manner, and there's a lot of nuances to it. I like to see the multiple layers, but I like to simplify. I think that if it's not simple, I don't know, I've been obsessed, I'm on a tangent here, but I've been obsessed with cults lately, and a lot of things cult leaders do is they use these complex word salad where they integrate all these different, they take science, religion, environment. And they mix them all together, even though they're not an expert on any of them. And they create a word salad of noise that I don't even know what they're saying. And it just, I don't know, it just like hypnotizes people to think that they know what they're talking about when they're just manipulative buttholes. So a big strength of mine is I keep it simple and I try to keep it personable. Like I I want to communicate at the level of the person I'm speaking to. I'm not here to confuse anyone or talk over them. I'm here to connect, simplify, and have conversations. And luckily, podcasting was a good medium to do that. And in that area of strength, what would you say is something that businesses don't know but should? Their target client doesn't speak their language is the simplest thing. And A big thing, I'm not an expert on needs analysis, but a big thing and a simple thing that I'm sure a lot of listeners already do, and if so, inject steroids into it, is just surveying your current clients, surveying their needs, sampling products with them, giving them free tastes of the things you offer, getting their feedback, and developing solutions for them rather than a projection on I needed. First off, if you needed it, someone else does. That is not a bad strategy. It's a simple strategy, but at the core, it's not about you and what you needed. It's about them and what they needed. So ask questions to your current clients, ask questions to your current prospects. I'm randomly weaving the podcast into all of this, but by hosting a podcast, that's what I did. I had a conversation with business owners so I could understand how they speak, what their goals are, why they do what they do. And then when I created solutions, I created those products around the people that I wanted to serve. Certainly. If we can go a little bit more granular on this idea of podcasting. When you started off, how long did it take you to actually be able to source or find clients as a result of your podcast? It's, well, that's a difficult question because it's a nuanced answer. I'll give you a super broad strokes. Sure. So in 2016, I started a music podcast. Again, Rochester, New York. So I called it Rochester Groovecast. And the reason I started that music show is because I was a music advocate. I was going to every concert. I was handing out flyers. I was running merch booths. And I wanted to get into more places for free. So I set up a podcast so I could amplify the music community. And I never actually, if anything, it was a cost center. Like I never actually was making much income doing that. I was just doing it as a hobby as I worked in a corporate role. And then when COVID hit, 
I basically rebranded from late night music Ben to business Ben and no longer treated it just as a hobby, but treated it as more of a communication and marketing channel. Mm -hmm. And why it's some completely nuanced and hard to answer this question is my first ever client, once I signed up for my LC, was a charter school that found my music podcast on Google and wanted me to teach podcasting to their students. And so their students had a podcasting elective chess podcasting trivia. These students chose podcasting. They wanted me to teach it. They found me on Google because I'm a good enough of a marketer that I ranked high for podcasting in the area. And that was my first client. So that started, gave me a little bit of a baseline income that, wow, I'm making money as an entrepreneur now. I don't have to necessarily go back to my, I was searching for jobs and I wasn't finding mm -hmm. one at the time. So that gave me the platform to gain more clients. I did a 22 episode launch in November of 2020. That's mm -hmm. Monday through Friday. Every day I did one episode. Two of those people became clients of mine. I'm thinking to myself. But if you imagine a family tree of networking connections, mm. those 22 episodes of local business leaders and the nominations they gave, the introductions they gave to other local business leaders was the baseline of that family tree that mm. ended up breaking down to over a thousand people that I know by name just through networking <laughs> since that all happened. So fascinating. I know that's a long-winded, not so simple answer, but that's what happened. And the reason I asked is, listening to what you were saying before, you seem to be very much interested in the individual and their, their set of experiences, their journey in the business, which I know there are other people who talk about using podcasting as a sales tool, as it were, in order to get potential clients on their shows and then make a sales pitch towards the end. But to me, and perhaps if I'm hearing you correctly, you're suggesting that the podcast show is really about the guest and, and really showcasing them, not so much sales pitch. Is that the kind of approach that you've taken? Oh, a hundred thousand percent. So it is a sales tool. It's not a sales pitch. And I've had people do it to me with tact and I was open to it and I wasn't actually upset but I don't even pitch during the conversation itself. The podcast is to build a relationship. And your weak ties often lead to more business than some of your stronger ones. You never know who you can help and who can help you. And if, especially as a host, if you don't show up prepared, you don't have class in what you do, your questions maybe stink, the guest is going to be a little put off. They're happy that you invited them, but they aren't necessarily impressed. As a podcast host or a podcast guest, this is a great opportunity to do two main things. One, build a relationship with someone and impress them and their audience. So it's more building relationship, thought leadership, getting better at speaking, getting better at talking about what you do. But there's no call to action at the end of the show for me. I don't have a squeeze page where I'm bringing in your email. I could give people resources. They're completely free. They don't need to give me their email. I'm not here to pitch. And when I'm hosting, I'm not there to pitch. I'm there to build a relationship and build trust through thought leadership by having a conversation where it gets really nuanced is it's giving the other person a business-like experience. It's not a business transaction where someone exchanged money, revenue for value, but it gives the person that vibe, that feeling that they know what it would be like to work with you. They followed up, they showed up on time, they do good quality work. It gives them that feeling so they understand what it would feel like to work with you. So even if they don't, they know what it would be like too, and it's easier to ask them for referrals, if possibly there's anyone you can help. So mm -hmm. this is all very nuanced. But if you go into let's bring value, let's knock it out of the park, 
let's build a relationship. Relationships act relationships actually create referrals, but you don't go in with looking for the referral. <laughs> you go in looking for the relationship and you deserve the referral, which generates income. And that's why if someone wanted to make a billion dollars in a year, I wouldn't recommend podcasting. It's a long game. It's very nuanced, yeah. but it's very valuable if you're in a relationship-based business. Uh, I love the intentionality of that, and I'd love to explore that in a moment. Uh, mm. But uh, elaborate, if you would, on this idea of creating a podcast network. You just said that podcasting itself is a long game. It's a lot of work. Why create a network? Yeah, a little bit of ADHD, a little bit of neurosis, a <laughs> little bit about just loving trying new things, loving what I do. I joke all the time. I've been saying this in marketing, but it goes the same way in any category in life. If you were to show up to a personal trainer, you don't like the way you look. You think you need to lose a little bit of weight and put on a little bit of muscle. You want higher confidence, better health, and better sleep. And all they did is work out your left arm. Would you want to hire that person for more sessions if they're not working out your right arm, your legs, diet, sleep? Like they're, it's, there's, they're only good at one tiny thing. And I find a lot of people, it's good to niche down, but when you can only do one thing, you can't serve all the needs of your clients. You need to be a generalist in some regards. You want to work the left, the right arm, the legs. You have to know a little bit about health. You need to know a little bit about sleep or have referral partners that can come in and answer those questions. So to answer your question, the reason I have a network of five and technically now it's six shows mm -hmm. is because one of them's a panel discussion. One of them's local to Rochester, New York. One of them's international. One of them's Ben's Bites, where I just talk about whatever monologues, whatever I want. One of them's 15 Minute Fridays, which is easy to implement business tips. And, I'm, and the other one's Real Hits, which is where I rebroadcast other podcasts on my stream. It's like when you're watching Comedy Central and you see something that was once on Cartoon Network, that same kind of concept. And the reason I do that is I want someone to be able to gain value in whatever way, if they want to hear me, if they want to hear a panel, if they want 15 minutes or less, they want a 60 minute story. It's all there. So I'm holistically looking at the listener and trying to serve them in any way I can. Hope that makes sense. That's a very long mm. answer to a simple question, but. So, so you're really trying to meet people where they're at and, yeah. and, and their particular listening needs as well. It's a buffet. It's a buffet yeah. is an easier way to put it. Certainly. Okay. We've, co I mean, we've touched upon this idea of why you've created the podcast and uh, now podcast network. You've talked about wanting to build a, a relationship during the podcast with a guest that you have on. Yeah, is, is that the only intention that you have during the podcast or is there more to it? If you were to really get to the core of it, the number one thing is I'm new at this role. I was a sales executive for a marketing firm, I handled one piece of the pie. I was great at that piece, but I didn't understand the big picture. And by having conversations on a business podcast with people that have accomplished what I'm seeking to accomplish and have went through what I'm going through, I have a unique inner door sit down coffee chat with people that can really help me better, be better at what I do. So it's those both things at once. Mm -hmm. I want to build a relationship because relationships are currency. Like we are the people we know. We want to build goodwill with as many great people and help as many people as possible, even in the smallest of ways, even if it's just holding the door open for someone who's having trouble walking into the grocery store. Like those little bits of goodness makes a better world. But I also get to humble myself I'm never on a high horse. Like I have a million things I still need to learn. I get to humble myself and learn from these people while I build a relationship with them. It's, it's the yin and the yang. I can't think of a better way to do it. And it's been a great experience thus far. Mm -hmm. So there's the one-to-one -one relationship with the person that you're talking to. 
Yeah. Uh, obviously for a podcast, it's almost like a platform, a stage wherein you have the opportunity to speak to an audience as well. What are your thoughts on building an audience for the podcast and for yourself as a personal brand as well as your business? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like the person in front of you comes first, the audience comes second. And let's just say theoretically, the person you're speaking to is someone you'd like to be in your audience. If they don't like you, why would 50,000 other people like you? Like, you want to show up for each person in each moment. I don't know exactly who's listening, but my goal is to show up the best I can for you in hopes that helps them as well. So even if the only listeners are me, you, my grandma, and your, I don't know, a colleague will just say, even if they're the only listeners, I want those listeners to gain value from the conversation. So it's building micro relationships. It's building a micro audience. It's focusing on the people you're serving day by day, knowing that there's a ripple effect that occurs and you'll gain more listeners and gain more followers and gain more impact. But even as I'm sure you've seen it, like even as the podcast grows or the business grows or any of this stuff in the thought leadership space grows, a lot of the listeners are quiet. You never know exactly who's paying attention and how you can help them. So it's just a mission of mine to humble myself knowing that I don't know who exactly I'm helping, but I want to show up for them just in case they need something. And whether or not someone reaches out and says, Vinay, Ben, thank you for this conversation. I know that people are listening and hopefully gaining value from what we do. With this idea of the audience and the podcast, there is obviously a lot of conversation around repurposing the content yeah. that we produce from the podcast to create the snippets, if you will, that could be shared across social media, other platforms in order to increase our reach. Is there anything else that you find has worked well for you in terms of building your audience? Yeah, you nailed it with content repurposing. We'll talk about that super briefly because let's, whether or not you're in like an enterprise scenario or you're a sole proprietor, look back at the time when you were as the biggest team you've ever been a part of. How many people on that team had a personal brand? In most cases, it's sometimes even zero. Oftentimes the best sales rep, the CEO, HR, none of them speak out on social media. And I think that's a really big disservice because there's a lot of people that don't know who you are, that you could be serving with your products and services, or even just your education that you're not reaching. So putting out content, whether the podcast is the gold mine where you start or not, putting out content's brilliant. Because if you're in a leadership role, don't you think you're going to continue to move up? If you're the leader, don't you want to set a great example for the people below you? And even if you're towards the bottom, don't you think it gives you job security when you have a built-in personal brand? They're going to want to promote you because you're poachable. Let's be honest. If someone's got a strong personal brand, they have a good relationship. Maybe they have a podcast. They have lots of relationships, I meant. And they're building out like something for themselves. The company is going to either put resources into you or you have the capacity to move to a company that will. So right. podcasting is just one way to create a personal brand, create content, relationships, get yourself online. It's just one way. It's a really good way. And then you repurpose that into bite-sized content, et cetera, et cetera. We can go that route. I don't even recall if I answered your question. I'm just really passionate about the fact that it doesn't matter what role you're at, start putting yourself out there and it'll better you for the long run. Hmm. But is there some thought to going beyond just repurposing content and putting yourself mm -hmm. out there to actively engage and perhaps activate the views quite folk who are listening in yeah. in order to engage in more of an interactive dialogue. I guess what I'm asking is, 
are you actively thinking about ways in which you can take the audience that you have and create other scenarios or platforms wherein you can better engage with these folks as part of your overall networking yeah. efforts? And thanks for asking again, because as you were rephrasing, I'm like, oh, that was the question he asked. The building, building relationship and growing the audience, engaging with them. It's difficult. The best answer I have is softly provide as many call to actions as possible. For example, my email list isn't huge, but there's about a thousand people on it. It's a good number of people for a small business just getting started building that list. I sent out to my email list. Hey, would you like to be on my podcast? A clickbait heading. I'm not bringing everybody on for a long form interview. And I said, I have a segment called Ben's Bites where I'd like to start answering my listeners' questions so I can tailor the content around what you need. And I said, you can basically, this is the short version. You can type your question below in this email or you can click this link and leave me a voicemail. And in less than 24 hours, I got over five voicemails, got messages. Some people ignore it. I don't know if that's a good rate or not, given the size of my list, but that was over five people that took action to leave that voicemail. Now on my show, I can play their question, answer it, share it back to them, and then they'll probably feel more opted to share that episode to their audience. So that's one call to action, asking people just every episode, like, I, literally like none of this works without you, the listener. If you could send me or Vinay a DM, just letting us know that we said something good today, that would mean the world. Like you probably have experienced this. I know I have. I put like a lot of effort into an episode and once in a blue moon, I hear complete crickets. And I know that people are listening and I don't think people realize how profound it is to do that reach out. A sales trainer friend of mine, Jerry Acuff, he says he'll go on a keynote speech, talk to 20,000 people, give out his phone number. This is my phone number. He'll get five or six phone calls. So he just got paid tens of thousands of dollars to be there. He gave you his phone number. Do you think the person calling is going to stand out? So this is stepping away from being a host. Every time I listen to an episode, I reach out to the host and the guest and say, hey, here's a big takeaway. Thanks for putting on the show. Because I know that it helps give people confidence that people are actually reaching out. So this is my long way of saying, I tell stories like this and I like to give call to actions to encourage people to start a conversation. If you want to go super more practical, you could set up a Facebook group. You could set up a Mighty Networks community. You have call to actions in your social media posts. Give me your top takeaway in the comments. You start having conversations with them in the comments. There's no one size fits all or even a one size fits most. I'd say the one sentence is just ask. Provide call to actions. And don't assume that since you asked one time, that's enough. Mm. Ask as many times as necessary. Possibly ask every single episode. Are there other aspects to intentional networking, as you, as I would describe it, that you believe most people don't really think through? Yeah, if so, what would they be? Yeah, I'm pausing because I want to give you a sure. <laughs> strong answer to a strong question. So. It's really funny because when people ask me about like pitfalls and struggles and things people do wrong, I sometimes draw a blank because when people see difficulty, I see opportunity like, oh, this is a struggle. This isn't even like an issue. This is just something I get to work on and get better at. I think oh, you touched on it in your introduction that I feel like for some people, certain personalities, networking can feel just lifeless. It can feel just transactional. Hey, my name is Ben Albert. I work, I'm going to say a monotone voice on purpose. My name is Ben. I work at Balbert Marketing. We help businesses save time and make money with proven marketing systems. We could possibly help a business owner like yourself. What do you do? Oh, it's just nothing's being accomplished other than 
people have a bunch of boxes in front of them and they check, oh, this is a prospect, this isn't. This is a prospect, this isn't. I think networking should be more personal. I think a big issue is people go in thinking they need to do it the old fashioned way. They spend hours practicing their elevator pitch. They're sweating and not even listening. They're just waiting for their turn to speak and they're not being present in the moment with the people around them. So what I like to do, and I have a podcast and I have a blog, which makes it really easy for me to do it. I like to look for interesting people that I can collaborate with. Who can I create something valuable with? And if I have that lens on, I am still in essence checking a box, but I'm not listening for their industry and what role they are at the company or their business name. I'm listening to what are they passionate about? Why do you do what you do? Who do you help? Give me a story. And then when you have that lens on, it, the conversations are just more enjoyable. That's mm. me projecting my perspective. But for me, those deeper conversations where I can go maybe a layer deeper is more enjoyable. So if anyone feels like they're not enjoying networking, maybe it's your fault. Maybe mm. if you were to ask a question, well, we've been doing this all day. Just tell me a little bit about how you got started into sales. Asking a question like that, just tell me about why you do this. We'll open up the conversation. Both people might, their commission breath will disappear. The guard comes down. Humans buy from humans who sell to humans, who fulfill orders for humans. We don't have to put on a mask and try to be someone we're not in networking or any conversation for that matter. So a the, lot of this is philosophical. I hope I, I hope it's helpful. I know it's a little more philosophical and nuanced. Uh, no, but I, I love your thinking. I certainly resonate with it personally. And it's probably a little bit different to what we normally hear in the, uh, in the public sphere, what, what an internet search would bring up. It's, uh, thank you for sharing. Now, you have coined a term around what you do as creation-driven working. Is there more to what you call creation-driven networking, or is it pretty much what you've talked about so far? There's so much more to it, but we've been, that's basically embodied in everything we've talked mm -hmm. about. So I call the CAN system, lots of C's, but I'll simplify, create, content, collaborate, and network. Create and network, content and networking, like collaboration and networking. The sole purpose of networking can be to build something. So when creation-driven networking comes into play, it's just that. I am basically content and relationships are what dri drives why I do what I do in networking. Creating content and relationships. Car drives the networking endeavors. So you can start a podcast. Hey, Let's create content, collaborate. This is not exactly how you'd say it. It's a word salad that I said not to do. But hey, let's create content, collaborate together, amplify each other's voices, and share audiences on a podcast. That's not how you bring it up, but that's, the, that's what's happening. You're creating content. You're sharing audiences. You're learning from each other. You're building something together. So instead of networking and just moving on and networking, you actually just network and click record. That's really all that's happening. Or you host a live event together. Hey, I'm looking to put on a live event. And honestly, I'm just one guy. I need other ladies and gentlemen to come to the table and help me. Would you like to partner with, on this event? Mm -hmm. Or let's say someone else is running the event, volunteer. And before you know it, you're on the advertiser list that people paid thousands of dollars to be on because you're a volunteer for the event. If you want to seat at a table, if you want to speak, why don't you just bring your own table? You bring your own mic. So the point is that let's create content and collaborate together. That will drive the relationship. We have a similar value of some sort, whether it's a charity, a love of SaaS, a love of learning, wanting to help children. We align there, so we meet on a commonality. Mm. Let's do something together around that commonality and then build a relationship by action. It's, 
I'm literally like stuck in my own head right now because I can't think of a better way to build a relationship because you're creating something bigger than yourself as well. You're helping a charity, like you're helping people as you build a relationship, you're growing your business as you build your relationship, you're sharing audiences. To me, it's the best way to do it. Love it. You mentioned uh, that one of your podcasts is a panel format. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, is it like a live show? So this particular show is live on LinkedIn. Yes. Okay. So I'm curious, uh, how, how would you go about putting something like that together? Because not only do you have the difficulty of coordinating people to come onto the show, there is also perhaps more of a conversation to be had around audiences and things of that nature. But I'm trying to tie that idea of serving, mm-hmm. bringing people together into this, into what you were just talking about, to the whole can concept, as you put it. How, how does that work? Do you elaborate and talk us through that? Yeah. So with a panel comes multiple people, which comes multiple opinions, schedules, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be very difficult. I'm not going to proclaim to be an expert at it. You got to talk to someone who hosts a live radio show. They deal with it all the time. The particular panel I'm part of, it's called the ABC Lunch Break Hour, and it's AB with a squared. It's Andrew, Brandon, Ben, and Christine. We're the ABC. So it's us four every single time. So we have the luxury that it's the same time once a month, every month. So that's easy to coordinate, just show up the same time every single month. What we did, we took the ABC concept and we're doing the ABCs of business and growth. So what I do every month is it starts with A. We're up to, we just did, I think we're up to F. We're farther along than I think. I'm trying to remember. I guess I need to figure this out by the next one. But what we do is I put together a poll every single month with four concepts. So let's say we were doing A. You could do affirmations. You could do autonomy. You could do, what are some other A words that that people like to learn about? Oh, gosh. The listener's filling in the blank (laughs) for us right now. Uh, I'm drawing a blank here, but... Me too. It's funny. I do this all the time. I'm drawing a huge blank. And and then basically we give them four Mm. options. And then pull LinkedIn and based on what wins out of the four, right. that's our topic for the month. And one thing that I haven't done the way I could, and you're reminding me that I need to, is you look at the poll. And one thing that's beautiful about LinkedIn polls, the person who posted the poll can actually see who voted what. This is a way to get slightly into the mind of your prospect in reality you see what they're interested in. So anybody could put up a poll. What kind of problems are you having as an SMB, et cetera, et cetera, and then figure out what problems people are actually having by the poll, and you can see who voted what. So talk about a way to get inside buyers' heads. But what I can do is look at, so all these people wanted autonomy. We chose A, autonomy. I can direct message everyone who voted for autonomy and be like, guess what? Autonomy won. Thank you for voting. We're going live at this time. So that's a process on how we do the LinkedIn live. And then it's recorded live, but then I re-release it as a podcast afterwards. So if someone can't make it during the lunch break, that's fine. So that's peering inside the background of what goes on. But my gosh, it can get confusing the more people on the project at a time. I would imagine so, yes. And something I haven't quite delved yeah. into as yet. But thank you for explaining that to us. So you're really looking to develop content that has mutual benefit, plus benefits the audience and amplify voices all the while trying to connect with your audience. There's often times a lot of talk about calls to action. You've suggested doing it softly. And I guess my question is, do you, to give the audience a call to action, or is this very much focused around your particular guests that you have on the show? 
Yeah. So as a host, so you're saying as a host, how do I provide a call to action? Yeah. On a, if the whole idea is to further your business, are you just very much focused in on the guest and perhaps suggesting things to them that would make sense? Or is there also more of a general call to action to check out your website or services, et cetera? Yeah. So I do less call to actions than I could. Part of the intro is we don't do advertisements. My fear for the show is if you gain value from this episode, share with a friend and explain mm -hmm. your favorite part. So I say right in the intro, welcome to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbird Marketing LLC. Again, powered by Balbird Marketing LLC. We don't charge for the show. My fee here is share with a friend. That's in a pre-recorded intro and a second version of it's in the outro. So that's already there every single time. So I physically don't have to say it every single time. So just embedding them into your process is smart. A lot of businesses and podcasters ultimately have ads in between. If you have an ad, but you don't have an advertiser because your show is not big enough that people want to put their ad dollars into it, you can just advertise yourself. I don't do it because I say in the intro, we don't do ads, yeah. but in theory, you can advertise yourself. But I think the best advertisement you can give is to make the guest look as good as possible, give them an opportunity to provide a call to action, make them feel good, because then it's a lot of this is very nuanced. But if you show up for your guest, your listeners are going to appreciate that. Your guest is going to appreciate that. And maybe that your guest isn't a client, but again, they can lead you into an introduction to someone who might become a client. Mm. So I'm always focusing on what's in front of me. I try not to <laughs> think about every single person on earth. I focus on how can I serve who's in front of me, realize anyone can be listening and just show up the best I can. Not my best answer ever, Vinay, but I'm <laughs> learning this. Yeah. What, do, what are your thoughts? What? Do you, how do you spread that message? Do you have call to actions at the front and end of the podcast? Do you send it out as an email? What's your strategy? I don't really have a call to action per se, if I'm being honest. Uh, I, I do mention at the intro that the podcast is brought to you by spreadwood.com so people can go there and check it out. I, sorry, correction. I do ask people to leave a review if they are so inclined to, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. There is no direct call to action to my services or business per se. Now, however, if it does come up in conversation prior or post podcast, so be it, but it's definitely not the intention or the direction that I take the conversation of the podcast to. Makes sense. That's fine. One thing, huh. call to actions can be humbling because a lot of people don't take them and you're like, I put out this ad and no <laughs> one clicked and it's, it can be humbling, but it doesn't hurt to try different strategies and see what works for you. Certainly. And you've certainly given me a lot to think about. Something I wanted to ask you is, do you find that having these conversations, doing networking as you do it, fuels your own thought leadership? Fuels my, I don't know if it cut out. Say that again. I apologize. It fuels your own thought leadership. Oh yeah. So it's interesting. So someone else called me this one time and I loved mm -hmm. it and I don't quite know what it means. Maybe the listener does. They say, Ben, you're like the thought leader on bringing together thought leaders. And it was really humbling thought leader at bringing together thought leaders because when I started my podcast, I already touched on this. I started Rochester Business Connections because I wanted more business connections. It's that simple. I was a minnow in a sea of same niche. I was a marketer who had just gotten started from a big competitor and no one knows who I was. I, I wasn't a thought leader, but what I became was a thought leader at bringing together thought leaders by being the listener, by being the mentee. I was able to build a tribe of mentors, connect people. And one thing that I did so much when I got started, people ask, how do I get more referrals? give more referrals. I gave as many introductions as possible. Just because I met someone super cool doesn't mean that they're off limits. I'd introduce them to more people. I was collaborating and building my network using podcasting 
and became a quote unquote thought leader at connecting people. But it wasn't, and I still wouldn't even consider myself a thought leader. It wasn't until a couple of years down the road that I had learned so much from so many people that I was more confident and convicted in what I do and how I can help. I spent many years as the learner. A lot of people want to jump into being the thought leader, but they're not a leader and their thoughts stink. So to be a thought leader, what I did is I jumped in as the student, the learner, and now that I've learned from so many brilliant people, I don't think my thoughts entirely stink. But if you want to build thought leadership, if you want to build that out, you need thoughts and you need to be a leader. So you need an audience or else you're not a thought leader and your message needs to be good or you're never going to retain an audience. And I think it's that simple. Is there perhaps an aspect to, to creation driven networking that you find people don't ask you or doesn't get talked about very much? If so, what would they be? That's a great question because usually people ask me all the same things. They ask questions like, how do I monetize my podcast quickly? And I think it misses the mark a little bit. The kind of questions that people don't ask is, how can this develop my soft skills to make me a better salesperson? How can this help me develop my speaking skills so I can be a better presenter, a better leader? How does this allow me to be present in the moment? What does this do for my fulfillment in learning something new? These are very nuanced things, but yes, you can start a podcast, drive revenue, build relationships, build a personal brand, thought leadership. Those are more tangible. But the stuff I think a lot of people miss is what kind of confidence do you have once you've asked hundreds of thousands of questions, you've guessed it on podcast and answered hundreds of thousands mm. of questions. How is your life going to change if you're a better communicator? How is your life going to change if you're the best at what you do? It's very nuanced. And I don't even know mm. if I have a perfect answer. <laughs> you just need to get in the mud, learn mm. how to garden, and then you have the nicest garden out of anybody out there. Mm. Sound advice there. Thank you for that again. And to wrap things up, uh, Ben, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your top takeaway? Yeah. So I'm going to try to squeeze everything together because I haven't yeah. said this yet, but I'll give a metaphor for everybody. So everyone wants the key to success. They want the key to happiness and fulfillment. There is no key to success. It's a combination lock quite similar to a padlock, each and every one of us has our own unique combination. Quite similar to why do you think they take your fingerprint when you get arrested? Because every fingerprint is unique. Every human is unique. There is no key. It's a combination lock. And this conversation could be part of that combination, or you could just throw it out and not implement anything today if it didn't serve you. But what I did, what you're doing, and what all the most successful people do is they were surround themselves with the right mentors, gain the right skills that build them up, and they create their own combination. So nothing I said today is gospel, but if you can just take one insight and implement it into your life, I'm pretty confident you'll have a better business. That's my opinion. Great. And if listeners are curious, wanted to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? Yeah. First off, you're already here. Click subscribe, five stars. You usually don't even have to leave a review just to hit five stars. So at the very least, just do that. And Real Business Connections, it's the name of my podcast. It's also the name of my business. There's Balward Marketing, but if you just type in Real Business Connections, where you are right now podcast app, Google, type in Real Business Connections, you'll find me and we'll start there. Terrific. We'll include links to that in the show notes. Ben, thank you so much for doing this. It's been brilliant. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. It's been fun. Mm.